am so excited to see such a nice crowd for Paul Horstead and his co-author John Nelson today and we thank you so much for coming out. Paul Horstead has been photographing South Dakota's people and places for nearly 40 years. Early in his career, he was a staff photographer at the Sioux Falls Argus Leader and later served as chief photographer at the South Dakota, South Dakota Department of Tourism. Now living in Custer, Paul has been an independent freelance photographer for the past 25 years. He is a co-author of a number of books, including the one he'll feature today on the Custer Expedition of 1874. We are pleased to have him here today with his co-author, John Nelson, and his lovely wife, Joanne. <laughs> Join me in welcoming Paul Horstead. Thank you. Thank you. How's that sounding? Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, I am going to talk about the Custer Expedition. I'll briefly touch on a couple of my other projects at the end. I think the program will go about an hour. I kind of specialized it a little bit for today. A lot of times I do programs for bus tours and groups and so on, and I'll kind of try to cover the whole spectrum of things that have gone on in the Black Hills, but today we'll, we'll focus a little bit on, on the Custer Expedition of 1874. So with that, uh, by again, just brief introduction, I've uh, been a photographer here for many years, uh, lived in Custer the last 20 years. I like doing landscape and nature and scenic photography, uh, of course, places like Mount Rushmore, but I've always been interested in, in history and you know you see these old homestead shanties and mining claims and so on and what was going on there a hundred years or so ago or more even. And, and one way I kind of stumbled into how to look at this, especially as a photographer, is to look at pictures that I get from these various sources and then try to set up my camera in such a way that when you're done, hopefully you have this sort of matching image of, of past and present. And, and uh, just kind of, I've called it standing in history. I mean, when I, when I get there and I'm looking at these rocks or trees, you know, it makes the hairs go up on your neck a little bit and you kind of wonder if the guy left his coat laying there or something. It just seems like it just happened in a way. And that's the experience I guess I'm trying to share a little bit in, in some of our books along with the writing, of course, that comes from my co-authors. But uh, this is my wife, Camille, uh, in the picture there. I'm sorry, I, I pointed at that screen, but you're obviously looking at that one. And uh, this is a little bit different setup than I often use, but it looks like it's working so far. So she's the graphic designer. Uh, I married well. Uh, uh, she's an artist and designer and designs all of our books, which we do self-publish. So really appreciate those of you who you know, have bought books. If you've you brought them along for a signature today, that's great, or bought one already. That's how we make each one of these books has sort of been built on the previous one, as you'll see. And also a huge debt to my co-authors, uh, John Nelson on the left, who's with me here today, and his wife Joanne uh, will be at the signing table afterwards, and Ernie Graffy, Ernest Graffy on the right, who I know people here know, uh, who has resided in the hills for many years. He's currently in California, but he and I co-authored the Exploring with Custer book, and then all three of us worked on the Crossing with Plains Custer book more recently, and so a lot of what I'm gonna share with you today is, is these guys' work, okay? Um, so we're talking about this huge expedition that came down to the Black Hills in 1874. And you know, one basic thing is why, why did this happen? And, and uh, Private Ewert perhaps uh, explained that pretty well just by saying you know, there was a, a blank spot on the map that needed to be filled in, in more or less his words. And, but there were some, some official reasons for it. Whether or not you know, we agree with those today, it's still being debated about the treaty, the 1868 treaty and so on. But General Sheridan, uh, talked at one point about putting a, a fort out here somewhere because they thought that Indians were raiding from the Black Hills going down into Nebraska and this was sort of where they were hiding out. So there's talk of a fort on the west side of the Black Hills and even a mention of him discussing that with the uh, president at the time. Um, but also clearly they were interested in gold. I mean this was being discussed openly in the newspapers at the time before Custer even left Fort Lincoln that would they find gold out in the Black Hills and so that's definitely part of the maybe unofficial reason for the expedition. And I kind of like this one here. Custer late in the process when they were already going to go and everything, but he came up with this calculation where if they took all the mules and horses, 1,500 of them, out of the fort, they wouldn't have to pay for hay at Fort Lincoln. They could just feed them along the trail and that would save $16,000. And if only our government was so efficient today, right? But uh, so that's kind of a, a, a humorous, but uh, something that he came up with, it was quoted in one of the newspapers at the time. Um, but we do have this, this Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868 standing uh, you know, in, in, as an issue in this whole expedition. And uh, um, I'm, I'm not an expert on that per se, but there is language in there. In the fine print, it does say government agents or you know, authorized by the government can pass over these treaty lands. Uh, I'll leave it up to you and everybody else to decide, you know, does that include uh, 
uh, 110 wagons and 1,000 people, you know, we'll, we'll leave that discussion perhaps for another time. But this expedition was led, of course, by, by Custer. He's in, on the left there in the picture. Um, he's accompanied by many other folks, though, as we see. Um, 995 men uh, names are visible on the roster of this expedition. Uh, and then one woman named Sarah Campbell. And uh, Custer also had uh, a number of Indian scouts with him who were invaluable. He had never been here, and a lot of these gentlemen had been, and so they're clearly guiding him. This is written down in some of the written sources, and you kind of see it in this picture. They're all looking at a map there as they head for the Black Hills with Custer. And so these are people that had visited this area. They knew where the campsites might work out, where they could find hopefully wood, water, and grass. These are these three things they really needed. Obviously wood for campfires, water for the animals and the men, and grass to feed this machine that was this huge uh, expedition being pulled by horses and, and uh, uh, or by mules and, and lots of horses, of course, with the cavalry. So um, they, were, they were definitely an important part of his uh, strategy of getting to the Black Hills. Um, then along with that, there were uh, five newspaper reporters in, involved uh, that uh, came along and were writing down stuff that was happening almost every hour of every day on this expedition. And so their accounts as published in uh, national newspapers, Chicago, New York, and elsewhere, um, give us a lot of information today when we read those. Our first-hand accounts are sitting there right there with Custer or with other things that were going on on this expedition, and uh, we really value those sources a lot. There were a couple of miners along as well, uh, Horatio Ross and Frank McKay. They did indeed, of course, discover gold down by where the town of Custer is today on French Creek, and uh, a lot of that leads directly to us sitting in this room today, you could say. I mean, all of the history that follows, white history in the Black Hills, follows on the heels of this expedition. There was a team of map makers under a guy named Captain Ludlow, uh, who I think if uh, we could interview anybody in person on this expedition, it would probably be Ludlow over Custer. I mean, he just uh, is such an interesting man and left us such a wealth of information uh, in his official report. Uh, after the expedition that has allowed us to literally follow this expedition's trail and, and map their campsites and so on, which we couldn't have done without that. So I'm going to talk more about mapping in a little bit here. There were several uh, scientists uh, along uh, who were studying the rocks and plants and fossils. This was an official government expedition. They weren't d d just down here fooling around. You know, they were expected to report back to Congress and, uh, and turn in what they found in this unknown or relatively unknown region of the of the United States at that time. Uh, and then uh, along with that, uh, we're moving to the photographer. Uh, got a little special section on him coming up, but his name, William Henry Illingworth, the photographer on this expedition. And you can see his wagon in some of the pictures, so I've kind of pointed that out. It's a little different square style than the, than the covered wagons that we typically see. Um, of course, there were uh, 110 of these covered wagons uh, carrying all the supplies that would be needed for this expedition. Some of them were probably full of corn for the animals. Uh, maybe a wagon full of horseshoes to replace all those that were worn out, lots of other supplies that were necessary, and being pulled by uh, 660 mules. There's roughly six mules on each wagon. Uh, you multiply that out and then add the 800 cavalry uh, riding horses. So you've got roughly 1,500 animals. And uh, we've kind of done a loose calculation. In any one campsite, there would have been then 6,000 pairs of shoes just walking around. Uh, a camp on all these all these animals, so it's no surprise that some of these show up uh, even today. Uh, various ranchers have told us they've found these, or we've actually found some at some of these campsites on private property uh, over time. And then uh, we got uh, three cannons, excuse me, a, a cannon and three Gatling guns. Um, the photo, this photo is actually from the expedition. This is a picture from Fort Lincoln showing what a Gatling gun would look like. Uh, we don't have any clear photos of that on the expedition, but they did have those along. So this was a well-defended expedition. I'm, I got a question just a little bit ago about Custer and his sort of reputation as this bloodthirsty maniac, you know, uh, attacking Indian villages. And, you know, that kind of comes from the movies. I'm not trying to defend his actions at other times, but on this expedition, he was clearly just exploring. That's clear in his actions. It's in clear what he wrote. Uh, the newspaper reporters were talking about this. They actually came across a village up by uh, where Deerfield Lake is today that he was you know, going out of his way not to alarm them. He really just wanted information. Uh, it didn't go as well as he hoped. But, and there were other times where they ran into Indian scouts or their own scouts ran into other small groups of Indians out on the plains. And it was not a, you know, an immediate attack situation. He was definitely not on the warpath uh, at this time. Uh, really, I think, thought of this as an exploring expedition. But 
I could talk more about that if you have questions about that, but I'm, I'm no defender of Custer and his actions at other times, but on this expedition, uh, I think what I've said is, is holds pretty true. Um, and then finally, uh, we have, just to keep things light, uh, a 16-piece brass band uh, performing uh, nightly on the expedition. And uh, you can actually see this in one of the pictures, uh, or in this particular photo, if this uh, enlarges here, uh, that this gentleman has, a, a, one of the troopers has this horn hanging off the back of his saddle, a tuba or a baritone or, or some kind of instrument. And they all rode white horses so he can pick those out sometimes in some of the camp photos and so on. So they would perform it uh, in the afternoons as camp was being set up. They would play when uh, the whole wagon train hit some kind of obstacle where they're gonna have to dig a road or make a crossing for a creek or a river. Um, uh, the, the men would be working and the, the band would strike up some tunes to entertain them as they did that. So a kind of interesting thing. So this is Fort Lincoln where this expedition originated from. Uh, up in present day North Dakota. It was Dakota Territory at that time, of course. This is uh, right across the river from where the railroad ended at that time. And uh, that's 1874 there. Here's what it looks like today. Uh, and it's a state park. Um, all the buildings were torn down or uh, taken away by locals over the years when it was abandoned, I think in the 1890s. But they've rebuilt Custer's home now as part of this state park. And it's a wonderful place to get a little more history on this whole era if you're interested and you haven't been up there, I highly recommend a visit. So they're starting from there, uh, this map here, I know it's kind of a lot to take in, but we're up on up near Bismarck, North Dakota there, uh, uh, across the river there, and starting this journey across what would eventually be a four state area, mostly Dakota territory at the time uh, in 1874. And their journey begins on July 2nd uh, up there uh, at Fort Lincoln. They begin this process of traveling towards the Black Hills uh, using the knowledge of the uh, Indian scouts to guide their way and to hopefully find campsites. They get to the, the area of the hills on about July 20th. And again, they're kind of going around the west side of the hills, we think, because of sort of this idea of looking for a fort location, although that did not uh, pan out later, uh, later in time. And then, uh, so it took some, takes them almost three weeks to get here across the plains. You can drive that, of course, in you know, four or five hours now. But they eventually end up down by the town site where the town of Custer would be founded a, a year later. And uh, th that's where they established what they called their permanent camp, a place they stayed for five days, uh, the longest they stayed in any one place. Most of their other camps, the majority were one night camps, a few of them were two night camps. But uh, in this, this location, they set up a base and sent out exploring parties down to the Cheyenne River south down by Edgemont. They went out through Custer State Park uh, along French Creek, another group, uh, uh, just before this, Custer climbs Harney Peak at that time, called Harney Peak, of course. And uh, the photographer is taking lots of photographs in this, in this particular area as well. And then they begin their trip back, essentially, but still traveling through the Black Hills, still exploring, although they are on their way home now. And I won't try to explain the route in detail, but some of you probably know they came down the Nemo Valley there and up Custer Gap, and then out over the, the Hogback and, and end up uh, going up Interstate 90, basically, towards uh, where Sturgis is today and camp for a day or two there and then begin this trail across the plains again, arriving back at Fort Lincoln two weeks later on, uh, I believe it was August 30th. So that's their, their route in a, in a nutshell. Takes about two months. They're really only in the Black Hills for about three weeks of that time. And you know, I can stand here and tell you all this because again of, of Captain Ludlow's report and uh, the maps that he created showing the route of this expedition, the work that he put into this uh, with his assistance back in 1874. Um, these maps, when you scan them in and really look at them carefully, uh, which I think we were kind of the first people to realize or do early in this digital era, you can start to pick out landmarks that we recognize today. The dotted lines here are, you know, the route of the wagon train as drawn by Ludlow. The dates of the camps are near each campsite. There's the permanent camp out here east of Custer. And uh, places like Harney Peak, you can kind of start to, you know, do this. And at, at the, original, the original book we did, Exploring with Custer, uh, focused on the Black Hills part of this journey with Ernie Graffy, he came up with these plastic overlays. This was before, really, computers were as easily available as they are now. And we were literally kind of sliding these around on top of topo maps, trying to sort out, you know, where was Ludlow talking about? And uh, that was part of that process. And then later, of course, we used computer overlays, but which I'll show you here in a little bit. We also have a number of very nice handwritten sources, people that uh, you know, wrote personal diaries, uh, such as this one by uh, Winchell, the chief geologist on this expedition, uh, who uh, we found his diary up in the University of Minnesota archives. And so 
On July 30th, for example, he's writing, uh, we traveled 10 miles nearly, south e nearly southeast from our last camp and arrive in a wide grass valley. He's talking about the valley where the town of Custer is today, just a big open valley at that time. But of course now it's kind of filled in with trees and of course a lot of buildings and so on. But he also did some sketches, Winchell, the geologist, interested in these rock formations that he was approaching for the first time, you know, the needles and so on. And uh, it occurred to us, you know, at some point while we were doing this, well, maybe we can go back along the trail and figure out where he was doing his sketches. And, and uh, you know, it turned out this wasn't very far from Custer at all. Um, I often get asked, how did I get into this, you know, a photographer and, you know, doing all this. And part of it is, um, this is a view from my driveway. I live north of Custer, and you can probably see the relationship there. Those fingers of rock were right out there every morning when I go out to my mailbox. Uh, this is a telephoto shot. I mean, they're like two miles away, but, um, but I can see them over there. And, and that whole idea of this wagon train kind of going through the backyard almost uh, really intrigued me. And then, uh, of course, the photography, the stereo photography of this uh, wonderful photographer named William Henry Illingworth also uh, interested me a lot. So uh, a little bit about Illingworth. This is not his camera. We don't know what happened to that, or, or, uh, but it definitely was a stereo camera that would have looked quite similar to this with two lenses. So it's recording two images at a time on one sheet of glass, which he would have processed right at the location after he exposed it. It was called the, the wet plate process. And so these negatives, many of which survive and are still in our, or, or I should say are in our state archives in Pier, uh, they were acquired around 1921 from a collector up in St. Paul, and uh, they're, they're four by seven inches roughly in size, or I should say four by eight inches in size, and uh, two images side by side on a sheet of glass if they haven't been broken or cracked or anything. And then Illingworth would print these to a uh, photo paper that would then be glued to a card like this, and this is called a stereo view or a stereograph, and I'm, there's probably examples right here in the museum, but if, if uh, I'll, I'll have a picture of that here coming up in a second. The thing that comes into play for me trying to do this re-photography thing, I'm looking for every little scrap of information in a photo to try to tie the foreground to the background as I try to line up the camera in the correct position. And uh, so in a nutshell, if I can see the background, you know, I can work my way then over miles or feet or whatever it is to the foreground where these rocks are, let's say, and the negative is cropped when it's printed to these stereo views. So I prefer to work from a full negative if possible, but not all of the negatives survive. So we're forced to work with just the stereo views at times. But uh, this is that site then that he was photographing. It's just over the border in North Dakota, a place called Hiddenwood, uh, just, uh, just outside of Hedinger, North Dakota, between Hedinger and Lemon, South Dakota actually, and uh, on a private ranch. Um, but uh, that's the view I did, and I was trying to match, I was actually there on the same day, July 8th, 18, well, he was 1874, I was 2014, I think it was, and uh, uh, I was puzzled because the legs of my tripod were throwing a shadow, and ideally the sun would have been the same angle and everything, and I kid you not, I got to looking at the negative, and here, you know, was this shadow, you know. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Uh, it was just astonishing. I almost fainted, but... Uh, and uh, so then eventually, of course, uh, you don't see that on the, the stereo view image, but, uh, 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 but you can kind of make out that edge of that cliff and the Hiddenwood Creek there, and then of course see right where the, the campsite was there uh, up by, uh, at a place called Hiddenwood. So these, these uh, images, again, are printed to these stereo views. Uh, they're made to be put into a holder like this, which I'm guessing a lot of people in this room are familiar with. Uh, excuse me, I kind of went over that slide there. Was, you put it in the viewer, if you don't know that, you probably know about the view masters when we were kids. And uh, so you're seeing a stereo image. Things seem to rise up in front of you. And, and uh, now we got stereo TVs and movies and everything. You know, it just keeps recycling, you know, over and over again. But, uh, uh, and uh, Illingworth was a master at this technique. He, um, you know, a very accomplished photographer. All of his work is very sharp and clear. Even compared to photos I run into from 75 and 1876, sometimes it, you really do see different skill levels with the various photographers, and, and he was definitely uh, very good at it. Uh, I got to meet a descendant of his up in St. Paul, Minnesota a few years ago. This gentleman has now himself passed on, but, uh, uh, and uh, collaborated with him to place that stone there in the downtown St. Paul Cemetery. Uh, Illingworth did have kind of a sad ending to his life. He committed suicide in 1893. Um, without going into the whole story, just economic times were very hard. He was drinking. He'd been married three times. Uh, you know, I don't know if he was a, an entirely happy man, as sometimes artists are. And uh, so in any case, 
Uh, we do have that marker there that does mention the Custer expedition and also his work on the Fisk expedition in 1866. He was out in Montana on another uh, journey, a, a gold exploration. But he shot photos in Sioux Falls, uh, separate from the Custer expedition. He was over in Sioux Falls. He was all over Minnesota, up in North Dakota, Wisconsin. So you'll see his work uh, in collections and on eBay and so on from all over this region. So I feel like I owe him a lot. Um, and uh, so this is one of the first pictures he took in the Black Hills. He shot about 50 scenes, I'll say, 50 locations. Sometimes he would take two negatives, two separate stereo view negatives of a location. We think that was a standard thing with these photographers because they were worried about breaking one of the negatives. They'd have a backup, so to speak. So um, uh, 50 locations. I'm only going to share a few of these just in the interest of time, but they are all in the book, Exploring with Custer, uh, if you're interested in seeing all of them. And we do think we have found every photo site that he shot. There's a couple of them where it's sort of just bushes and stuff, and it's a little hard to tell, but, uh, but we did uh, finally locate the last sort of mystery site, and when we reprint the book, we'll update that one. But you can ask me about that later. So there's the legs of his tripod again, as we saw a minute ago, uh, and the black cloth probably over his head, looking through the, the camera there, perhaps. And his exposures would have been, you know, 10 seconds long, perhaps, or maybe even a little longer. Uh, this is at Indian Cara Mountain, which is over on the west side of the Black Hills, north of Newcastle, and a lot of you probably know that country. Uh, and there is a marker there, not right at this photo site, but nearby that shows where they camp. So again, I wasn't able to get to these sites on the same day as Illingworth every time, but on this case I did because I wanted again to have that, that exposure uh, with the sun coming up in the same time of day. It was about 7.30 in the morning. Uh, this would have been the same day, July 23rd, that Custer and a number of other guys were climbing Indian Car in the background. They're trying to get a look at the route into the Black Hills and see what else they could see from up there. But the atmosphere was very smoky, uh, hazy from fire wood smoke, and they attributed that to the Indians setting fires somewhere. I think it very well could have just been a, a forest fire somewhere going on in Montana or something, you know, and the smoke blows over here. I think that was a common thing back then, as we've all seen ourselves now in the the modern day, but in any case, uh, that photo, again, these negatives are very crisp and clear, and you can enlarge details even from print. So we have this, this object in the picture, and what I do enjoy about going out to these locations, you know, you'll see something like that in the photo, and you get out there and say like, holy mackerel, you know, there's that thing sitting there. And uh, so this is a tree stump that's, uh, you know, still laying there in this pasture. Um, it's, it's a tree that's tipped over, and so you're kind of looking at the bottom of it, and the roots are sort of sticking out. Like, like fingers there, but, and then a barbed wire fence behind it. Now, this is on a private ranch over there by Indian Cara, but of course we had permission to, to go out there and photograph. But up in the Black Hills, a lot of these photo sites are on public land, and some of you probably know we put in GPS coordinates and so on when they're on uh, public land so that you can navigate to these. are on Forest Service property, generally, and uh, uh, this one in the Castle Creek Valley, this is above Deerfield, about eight or nine miles, and uh, um, you can, you know, with some hiking, it's not a dire hike, uh, but you, there is some terrain there. You can get to this spot and, and uh, look at that view. And uh, again, there's some, uh, some stumps here that show up uh, from 1874 that are still in place. Even this little, little thing here, you know, really gets me. Uh, but these are trees that burned in a fire probably 20 or 30 years before the 1874 picture. So uh, uh, just by frame of reference, this is what that site looked like um, before the Forest Service, they, they asked me, like I was the one to make the decision, but I mean, they were very kind about it. They want to know, should we trim some of those trees out of the way so you can kind of see into the background? And I said, well, how about if we document what was there? And that's what you're looking at here. And then this is the sort of trim view. You can actually see some trees laying there. This is the only spot they did that at, but uh, um, it does allow you then to see into the background. And I, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir probably in this group, but if you aren't aware of it, there's way more trees now than there were back in 1874 generally because of fire suppression, right? We've been putting out these natural lightning caused fires that used to keep the forest kind of spread out with big trees that were farther apart. Now we have allowed those open spaces to fill in mostly with ponderosa pine. And uh, so we have this dense forest, right? Now there's exceptions like up around Lee Deadwood, you know, Homestake was cutting, I think everything, but uh, large other areas of the hills, we see this repeatedly in all of these pictures of their camps and so on, you'll often have trees where there were no trees back in 1874. So now that's changing again with the pine bark beetle epidemic a little bit. And some of these photos I'm showing you are going on 10, even 15 years old. And 
We're just kind of starting to think about maybe redoing this book in three or four years with new photos of these locations again, just to see how far things have changed back. And what I see now with the dead pine bark beetle forest, like around Harney Peak and so on, really does look a lot more like it did back in this era. So it is kind of interesting. And I think our choices were either, you know, the beetles were going to do it or a fire was going to eventually. But I'm digressing a little bit, but it is something uh, that I think about a lot and be interested to hear what, what you might think about that. So this is their permanent camp where they stayed for five days down by Custer. This is three miles east of the town of Custer. And uh, tents and smoke in the air from the campfires. French Creek there right in the foreground. Uh, that's where gold was discovered, probably just a couple hundred yards off to the right. And again, you can kind of see how the, the trees tend to kind of creep down the valley. You know, they fill in the valleys gradually like they have where the town of Custer is today, for example. But, uh, but this again, right on public land, uh, about 50 feet off of uh, a public road, uh, front, uh, no, the road that goes up to um, uh, America Center Road, it's called, uh, just east of Custer there. So easy to get to. And so that photo was taken from about right here. There's now a road here. And then at some point, we don't know the, the sequence of these photos. We know the sequence of most of Illingworth's work. But in this area, he was working on a schedule we're not familiar with. And he shot a lot of work in this area. But at some point, he came across this valley. Then he's looking down over the camp again. There's one of the lines of tents, there's one here, and then there's others hidden in the trees down here. And there's French Creek again. I think he might have been, you know, maybe trying to get a picture of Harney Peak off in the distance there. And uh, so this is a fun place to hike to, you know, maybe 30, 40 minute hike, depending on your abilities. And you can look down and see Highway 16 there crossing from left to right, going into Custer State Park on the right there. And that's Wheels West Campground. So you can literally camp, you know, right where Custer was if you want to do that as well. Uh, and there's another campground around the corner here now, too. Uh, that's just, yeah, like I said, three miles east of Custer. And then uh, lastly, for this little bit anyway, on the Illingworth photos is this one of the grizzly bear uh, that, you know, was on covers of books and magazines and so on over many, many years. And, uh, you know, I, we despaired of finding this spot. And, and uh, we did finally, though, thanks to Ernie Graffy doing this thing with the maps that I was talking about earlier, um, you know, he's looking at it. I remember he's saying, well, it doesn't look to me like that camp. We knew this was taken on August 7th because they were in their camp. And there's lots of written sources about the grizzly bear being shot. Everybody was excited about it. The newspapers all wrote about it. The diaries all mention it. And they were at their August 7th camp. So the question is, where was the August 7th camp? And there was a historic marker placed in the 20s up by Nahant, a little former logging town. And it says the bear was shot in this area, according to, we think, a guy in the 1920s who was with Custer in 1874, but still alive, talking to the School of Mines president, uh, who was interested in documenting Custer. And he said, I think we camped here when that bear was shot. Well, it would have been 50 years earlier for him. And so we think that's where this error crept in. And so Ernie is telling me, well, it looks to me like it's two miles south of there. So we go, you know, permission from the landowners and so on, two miles south of there and found what we thought was the grizzly bear site. And then a local landowner, a, a local guy who had grown up in that area, I'm not telling this as well as I should, but actually helped us zero in the last 10 or 15 feet on these rocks, which you know are the same rocks that are in the grizzly bear photo. So uh, long story short, you know, we're searching the kind of the entire Black Hills, thanks to Ludlow's mapping and some other uh, help, we finally get to the spot where uh, these rocks that are made out of slate and have some lichens growing on them now, but like this is that little hole there. And Ludlow, that's Ludlow on the right, has his foot on this one. Um, so the people in the photo are Custer, of course, uh, Private Noonan, uh, possibly his orderly that day, Captain Ludlow, the map maker, and then this is a, a bloody knife, uh, 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 the Custer's chief Indian scout, bloody knife, and a uh, uh, man who was with Custer actually at the battle, a little bighorn, he was with Ben Teen, as it turned out early in the battle and was killed out there a couple of years later, as were a number of people on this expedition uh, at the 1876 battle. So very interesting uh, individual, uh, Custer's chief Indian scout. So that's kind of the story of Custer in the Black Hills. In a nutshell, there's a lot more, of course, in our book. But thanks to your interest in this book, I mean, I got to say, we're in our third printing now. And it allowed us to tackle the idea of trying to document the rest of Custer's trail to and from the Black Hills. We just simply didn't have the resources. I hope people understand. This was me and Ernie and Joe Sanders and uh, Jack McCullough from Rapid City and my wife, 
and a loan from the bank, you know, putting that first book out. And it took us three years, and that was just to document the time they were in the Black Hills. But then, uh, again, that book uh, has done well, and so it allowed us a few years ago to do Crossing the Plains with Custer, which is a separate book, but they complement each other. It documents the rest of that trail to and from Fort Lincoln. And we brought in John Nelson, who's with me today, uh, expert on um, all things Indian Wars, artifacts, and, and uh, lots of other things that he's studied. And he and I went to the National Archives in Washington, which we couldn't have afforded earlier either, and found this is actually the, the actual handwritten map that Ludlow created back in 1874 for his report that was going to Congress. You know, they still have it in a drawer there. Uh, amazing place, the National Archives. And we found other letters and lots of other background information on the Indian Wars period. Uh, in a week, uh, week-long visit to Washington when we did that. But, um, and uh, start to pick up additional information. There's just all these layers of things you can get into, and sometimes you go in a little too deep in certain areas. But this is an interesting one having to do with making the maps. What is this? That is an odometer uh, which was mounted on an odometer cart. I'm kind of making up the, uh, the way this worked here, but that was mounted on the back of a cart. Why would you have an odometer cart? Well, these would go along with the wagon train, so every day they would know how far they had traveled on a given day's march, right? So the wagon, the wheel would click the odometer, and then they would do a calculation. They knew how many revolutions of the wheel equaled a mile, and then they knew they went five miles, 10 miles, maybe 30 miles on a good day uh, when there was level terrain out, in the, out on the plains. So that's part of this process of making a map. Um, you also have, obviously, use a sextant to take, and I don't fully understand these concepts, but briefly, you take a reading off the North Star, you know you're at 45 degrees on planet Earth if that angle is 45, right? Uh, that's a real basic uh, navigational instrument, but there's other things you can do with it as well. And that's for latitude. And then to get your longitude, you need a device called a chronometer, which I can't even begin to explain the operation of because I didn't go to West Point like uh, Ludlow did. But uh, um, in any case, these were subject to error. So we sometimes find that the longitude, excuse me, the longitude is uh, off by up to three miles. When they do a latitude and longitude reading of their campsites, we're hoping they're right on, but sometimes it can be off by, by a fair amount. So this is just a little uh, Google Earth movie that I made to demonstrate how we use this to follow their trail across the plains. These are latitude and longitude readings that Ludlow took in 1874, basically just dropped into Google Earth like waypoints, like GPS, and then his map sized in an overlay to fit. So the dates of the camps are over the correct pin for that particular campsite, right? And it doesn't work perfectly. He didn't do this perfectly across the whole northern plains uh, in the brief time that he had, but in little chunks, you can, change, you can get this to work very, very well. So we then zoom in and you can see through Ludlow's map here now, the trail he drew on his map over Google Earth, right? And the white pins are places where we could see a road crossing that, I'll call it a ghostly trail. You know, there's not actually a trail there in very many places, but so all of these places are then could be loaded to a GPS and you can drive to each of these and look out the window and say, what do you see? Do you see anything that's described in a diary or journal? So we're starting at Fort Lincoln. Again, this is Ludlow's map, and he's describing Rolling Prairie, you know, uh, Buck Creek there. We're going to a camp. There's a camp. There's the next camp. There's the third camp. And there's the Black Hills, uh, you know, 300 miles away uh, as they travel across the plains. Now, we worried about the accuracy of this. I mean, I'm not a map maker. I don't have a degree in this or anything. But there were certain places like Double Butte on Ludlow's map. And here's where his map is telling us to go. And there's a highway right here. You can see it on Google Earth. And I'm literally parked in my car looking out the car window. And there is, you know, these two, <laughs> these two buttes. It was astonishing uh, to see that the first time. And then go over to uh, Ludlow Cave, which you may have heard of up in the Cave Hills. And again, his map guided us, you know, we knew where Ludlow Cave was, but it proved the, the sort of the accuracy of this technique and the accuracy of what Ludlow had put together on his map. So um, I'm, I'm compressing a process that in John's case was 10 years, in my case, five or six years, but we met hundred, literally 100 landowners along this trail. We'd go knock on a door, say, we think Custer was in your back 40. Can we go take a look around? Um, and uh, once they understood we weren't looking for oil or pheasant hunting, uh, you know, we were welcomed in with open arms. Just wonderful, wonderful people out along this trail. Uh, some lifelong friendships. And 
Some of them would say stuff like, well, my grandpa, you know, always talked about, you know, sometimes it would take a day or two, you'd be talking to him, and they'd go, you know, my grandpa plowed up a bunch of horseshoes, you know, back in the 30s, and I don't know what happened to those, but then there was a spoon with a U.S. on it, and, you know, you'd hear this stuff, and we, we suspected we might have been in the area of one of their camps, but um, the only way to really verify that is to try using metal detectors, and with the permission of these landowners on their private property, I emphasize, um, we began doing that, and that's John there, and you know, the problem is the accuracy of three miles. Um, we really don't know if the camp was here, here, or maybe way over here, and you're really just trying with a six inch metal detector to see if you can turn anything up. And, uh, but there were a thousand people there, and 1,500 horses and mules, and they were shedding metal and throwing stuff away and losing stuff at night, and, and so the payoff in time, uh, with a lot of effort, you know, might be something like this. You know, it's like, oh, I think I know what that is. And it's just below the grass. I mean, in some cases, there's very little deposition out on the prairie. And we've, we have literally found things laying on the surface uh, from the Custer expedition. But this is a, a 4555 cartridge. It's the, you know, exact kind they were issued. Uh, um, I think they have a couple in the museum here that we were looking at a little while ago. And uh, uh, it's in beautiful shape. It hasn't been fired yet, okay? And this is a very specific type of ammunition to 1874, so we know it wasn't dropped, you know, say in the Fort Meade era. It was, it was before that. Unfortunately, what we run into a fair amount, because things are so shallow, uh, you wouldn't believe how many cows have walked around this country in the last hundred years, and, and how many places have, of course, been plowed up, uh, oil rigs, railroads, interstate freeways, you know, gravel roads that sometimes just go right through where we think the camp is and it's really been uh, damaged uh, beyond repair, uh, not to mention the miles of barbed wire we've dug up, uh, fence post nails, bottle caps, you know, every type of ammunition that was fired since 1874. Uh, you know, there's a lot of debris out there. It's really surprising. But um, you keep at it and uh, um, you know, we have found things like horseshoes and mule shoes uh, on occasion, and these are um, gradually finding their way into museums like this one, the Journey Museum, uh, the museum up in Bowman, North Dakota, the Custer, South Dakota Museum uh, over in Sundance, and, and that's our goal. And we also met other people that had already been doing this, detecting on these ranches and finding things. We're kind of trying to encourage that as well, but they let me photograph a lot of those things. So some of the things you'll see in our book are from other collectors across the, the Northern Plains. So um, these are pages right from the book. And you know, one of the most common things we find are square nails. Uh, they use these uh, wooden boxes that were held together with square nails for all kinds of things, but uh, certainly for uh, hard tack and you know, ammunition. And those would be burned because they needed firewood. There was very little firewood out on the plane. So they emptied a box, they would burn it. What's left behind the nails? and the strapping that held these heavy boxes together. These are actually square holes. You know, you can tell they used a square nail to hold the box together. Uh, a, a fair number of buttons and so on. And this is just a small sample of the types of things that are found, but they're all shown in our book, uh, Crossing the Plains with Custer. So we have eagle buttons from officers' uniforms, have a C, which stands for cavalry, or I, which stands for infantry. Uh, we have regular uniform buttons made out of brass. We've got steel buttons, those were very common on their clothing. They're used on underwear and undershirts, but, uh, and then uh, other types of eagle buttons up here as well from the cuffs, from the, 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 the center buttons here. Um, but uh, again, these are the work of uh, many, many years of, of searching. Uh, utensils like this seem to just almost got thrown away sometimes. I don't know, it was at, like I said, at night or the conditions were such that they lost track of them in the grass, but these are typical military uh, forks and spoons that you see not only with Custer, but you know they would if they excavate at Fort Meade or out at uh, the Little Bighorn, they find these same exact types of utensils used by the military. And the, and the same thing with the knives, although some of these are more like civilian style uh, butcher knives or carving knives, as you might say. Um, so uh, a couple other things here, uh, food items. You know, you think about eating something and you throw away the trash, right? I mean, that's what they would do. And so this is a lid from a mustard container that we've you know, been able to date back to the 1870s. Uh, there's obviously liquor bottles, uh, beer bottles. This is just a fragment, of course, and the, the champagne or, or uh, whiskey bottles. And then uh, one of my personal favorites, and I did actually find these on a, on a ranch. Uh, this is Bass Pale Ale bottle caps from 1874. And you, know, I, you find these, and again, they weren't very deep, and they're made to be held on with a, a wire bale, like a champagne bottle, right? That's how they bottled things back then. And I thought, well, this can't be from 1874. And I go on 
Bass Pale Ale's website, they've been around since 1793, and they've used this, this red triangle as their logo since that time, and you can still see the red paint on this, on this bottle cap, and there's not just one, but they must have really been thirsty. Uh, there's four of them there. And then there's also some Jay and, uh, I forget, Burke, uh, Dublin. These came from England or Ireland. They're, they're imported beers, uh, but they were clearly with this, with this expedition. So a lot of the second book, Crossing the Plains, uh, Illingworth didn't take a lot of photos on the plains. So instead I did shots that kind of show where we think they pass by and what the terrain looked like and does it match what they're talking about. So of course he's talking about scarcity of timber, but these are all trees that have grown up since the Custer era when we've been no longer allowing prairie fires, if we can help it, uh, to burn across the prairie. Um, and then uh, this area is just north of the Black Hills in the jump off country, uh, a region of badlands as he called it, that was difficult for the wagon train to uh, get up and over, and uh, you can see that when you go there, you know, today you can literally see where the road goes is exactly where the wagon train followed as well through those badlands. And then this is from the top of Bear Butte. Captain, Lud or, yeah, Captain Ludlow wrote about going around the right side of the east side of Bear Butte uh, as they left the Black Hills area and uh, crossing a couple of creeks, which would be these two creeks you can see here uh, as seen from the top of Bear Butte. There is a photo, a great shot of, uh, I showed you the campsite earlier when I was doing the glass negative thing. That was a camp on the plains uh, that he photographed. And then also this shot of, of uh, Ludlow Cave up there by, by uh, Buffalo, by Ludlow, South Dakota, actually. Uh, of, a photo of that as it looked in 1874. And there's a whole story about their visit to Ludlow Cave, I'll save for another time, but they did pull stuff out of there that they found that had been left by the Native Americans in that cave. Uh, near the cave also is this carving. Uh, JT, we think, is Joseph Tilford, I believe, uh, and uh, July 11th is the date they were there. And this is up on a wall about as high as that sign. And we, you know, it's like, oh, how did he get up there? Well, of course, he was on horseback when he, you know, he just stood, sat on his horse and reached up, maybe not quite that tall, but, uh, and carved, uh, carved his initials uh, in the sandstone there, which is pretty easy to carve. We did have another diary surface. Uh, we have, I think, three diaries now altogether. These are handwritten, you know, valuable sources. And this one's by a teamster. Um, a woman who was in Custer bought our first book, and uh, a few months later she calls me and says, you know, I think this book that you did uh, is talking about the same thing that my great-great-grandfather was on. And she lived in St. Paul, and uh, it turns out a lot of people on this expedition came from St. Paul, so she sent me copies of it. And clearly he was a teamster on this expedition, the diary kept by her great-great-grandfather, a guy named Petron. And uh, he says here the thermometer was 90 degrees. We came to camp about five or six o'clock. There was water with some holes in it, or I'm sorry, there were some holes with water in it where it had rained. And we drank the same water that the mules had been drinking and walking through. And uh, you know, you got to think about that. It is, it is humorous uh, since 100 years have gone by, but you know, they were that thirsty to have to drink that water. And they really did have trouble finding good, clean water at a number of locations along this trail. And as a result, we have a couple of people buried along the trail that died of basically stomach ailments, uh, and then one soldier shot by another in a dispute. And there is one more grave up in North Dakota that's unmarked, but we, we think we know where it is. But these two are over by Indian Cara. You can see that in the distance. This is right near their campsite. And then this one's up along Nemo Road. Uh, you may have seen it. It's still tended well. It's got a flag over it, and the, the landowner there is very uh, friendly and you know, welcomes people to pay their respects if you're so inclined. So, so those are the two books on Custer uh, that you know, do mesh together, don't really overlap each other. Um, I can't tell you which one to buy. It depends on if you're interested in the Black Hills or that, more that story on the Plains where they actually spent a lot more time. But uh, you know, maybe in time you'd, you'd consider having both of them if you want that whole story. Um, I do want to just share, if I may, briefly a couple of other things I've worked on that you may or may not be familiar with. I get asked what I'm doing right now, and I'll save that for the very end. But I, I just love this idea of re-photography, of trying to figure out where somebody put a camera in 1876. Let's say this is a couple of years after Custer, and the changes that have taken place there, such as Stockade Lake being formed when they built a dam and flooding this former military site uh, where General Crook had camped. So I did a book called the Black Hills Yesterday and Today, which is just 150 more of these kinds of pictures. 
and uh, to eliminate hopefully confusion, there are some photos of the Custer Expedition in this book, but it's not about the Custer Expedition. I just wanted to include those very first pictures ever taken in the Black Hills in this particular book for those that didn't want the whole Custer story. So we're following you know, the stagecoach routes. You can see almost literally how those routes are right where some of our highways are today. And they've widened them out a little bit. And this is the road going into Deadwood from Spearfish uh, Highway uh, 85 there. Uh, but just north of Deadwood. Um, and you find major changes like up around the Homestake Mine, uh, the open cut back in 1912 in this picture, and how that, of course, uh, grew. Uh, it's the same building over here on the right in position, but the rest of that area of, of Deadwood, uh, or excuse me, of Lead, uh, uh, was moved or torn down to make room for that open cut. This will move a little faster now, but just a few more shots from that book, Deadwood in 1885. This is north of Custer along the Mickelson Trail. Uh, that's Cambria, Wyoming, coal mining town. There's Spearfish, South Dakota, uh, with Lookout Mountain there. And uh, uh, Pactola, which is now Lake Pactola. Sheridan, which is now Lake Sheridan. Uh, Man-made lakes, Hot Springs, which is still Hot Springs. And uh, Spearfish Canyon here with the Lower Falls there, Spearfish Falls, and then up at uh, Sylvan Lake with a hotel that burned down in the 30s and uh, going along the Needles Highway, uh, which they've also widened that out a little bit over the years uh, to accommodate these buses. But so uh, that book again uh, followed on the heels of the first Custer Expedition book, just, just more about re-photography. And then my most current book, the one that's out right now, my most recent book is this book on Yellowstone. I met a guy over in Cody, Wyoming, who had been collecting Yellowstone images for over 40 years and just has a, a world-class collection of these early pictures of the park. And we put together over a three-year period a book uh, showing 100 locations around Yellowstone, places that if you've been there, you'll probably recognize. I was looking for this kind of thing in particular, as I'd seen in the Black Hills, You know, this idea that these trees can survive, whether they're alive or dead, perhaps, in certain locations over that period of time. And so, um, it's, it's really, again, all about following these uh, pioneering photographers around and trying to figure out where they were standing and then trying to recreate that image in um, Yellowstone yesterday and today. And then what I'm doing right now, and I literally came from my computer this morning and I'll be going back on Monday morning, uh, is processing photos that I've been taking over the last four years in, in 24 other national parks. Uh, been on the road a lot and uh, doing book signings like this when I can to fill the gas tank for another trip, but this is uh, Zion National Park. I'll just whip through a couple of these. We're calling this our national parks yesterday and today, and it should be out this fall, by, we hope by October at the latest. Um, and uh, again, if you know Zion National Park, lots of cliffs and beautiful scenery there. Um, this is our, uh, Bryce, uh, Bryce Canyon National Park, um, Arches National Park, of course. This is Delicate Arch, and in the 30s, um, Still very much the same, of course. And then up in uh, Glacier National Park, I'm doing a lot of hiking um, and, and trying to do some shots that are in the back country as well as those that are sort of along the roads. This is out in Yosemite. i uh, been out there three times now. My, my first visits to a lot of these places are for this project, but uh, I'm hoping to perhaps do a book just on Yosemite. And there's always seems to be crazy tourists hanging off of rocks in a lot of these old <laughs> photos, but uh, uh, this is down in the Grand Canyon, and I, you know, that rock hasn't changed, so I know it didn't break off when he stood out there, but uh, you kind of have to wonder. I didn't see a skeleton or anything. And then I like this one because the guy is hanging onto a tree there, at least, and he's got his wife on the outside. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm sure she has her hiking boots on, right? Um, so that's the Grand Canyon and a lot, of, a lot of hiking out there. But yeah, that should be out. We hope, I'm just, we're just starting to put it together, and I've been doing some writing, and uh, hopefully get that together here pretty quick. So I do hope you'll uh, consider, uh, yeah, looking at my Facebook page if you want an update on this or my website, uh, you know, of course, or just call me up on the phone and I'll tell you how it's going. But so, uh, yeah, that's the, uh, the website there and uh, really appreciate your attention. I, I, uh, I know there's a lot to take in. I, I struggle with what to share. I hope this has been an interest. And uh, again, there's more in our books. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Now, are there any particular questions about the presentation I just did that I could help with? Yeah. When you were enumerating uh, who was on, the yes, you didn't mention the livestock, the cattle. Good point. 
anyway, I'll be glad to I, I, talk I've about always that. wondered whether yeah. those were whether the soldiers were uh, taking care of the cattle or whether right. they were cowboys. Good question. And uh, anyway, another question. <laughs> uh, are you familiar with uh, Adam Vinatieri's uh, yes. great grandfather? Yes. And, uh, That's great. If, if he'd taken him along to Montana, uh, the uh, Patriots would have lost. Good point. The Patriot. The last point was that the Patriots would have lost a great place kicker if Vinatieri had gone to the Little Bighorn with Custer. His great great grandfather was Custer's band leader. Uh, you know, one of the band members that I mentioned, and I should have mentioned Vinatieri. He's listed on the expedition roster, and his I forget great 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 grandson is this kicker in football, which I don't know anything about other than that. But uh, and then he also asked about livestock, and they did have. You know, we have not, there's, uh, the sources vary. They apparently took like something like 300 cattle along in case they couldn't find game along the way. And sometimes I mentioned this and I failed to. They were able to shoot hundreds of antelope and deer and elk. And they so brought they brought a lot, some of the cows made it all the way back to Fort Lincoln, you know, free feed all along the way, just like Custer said, it didn't cost them anything. So a lot of them did make it back. Bob. Uh, Bob Lee had a theory that they parked the cows somewhere outside the, the, the hills. And I've never seen a written source that says they did that. But I mean, I think they probably just trailed them through the hills. And I don't know if they had cowboys or what. But they did hire civilians. There were over 100 civilians on this expedition, including that wagon driver who wrote the diary I mentioned. So there could have been some, I'm sure, experienced cowboys as well. Any other questions? Yeah. The Indians and I'm sorry. What's that? I missed, I'm sorry, this is my... Any metal detecting or private hunting on Forest Service land? You know, yeah, he's asking about metal detecting on Forest Service, and that's just something we have not done. My understanding is it's maybe a gray area that, you know, mineral excavation is one thing, uh, historic items are another, and uh, so we have stuck to private land, and I, you know, obviously with the permission of the landowners, and I would encourage <coughs> just review those regulations carefully, but... Uh, um, you know, if you're going to do that. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I sure, Brian. Yeah, the, the, the last one we were missing, excuse me, Godfrey Peak. Godfrey Peak, there's one called Godfrey Peak, and it's this mountain and, um, uh, that we could not identify and uh, drove us crazy, uh, drove me crazy. I looked for it for weeks, I mean, literally hiking all around Harney and all up and down the needles and trying to squint as if the, you know, the sun was in the lens or something. And uh, a guy from the Forest Service, a friend of mine actually, Ken Marchand, uh, about five years ago, uh, using their sophisticated mapping software and so on, he sends me this picture and I see right away, that is Godfrey Peak, where is that? A modern photo. And what he had done was airbrushed off the tower on Harney Peak. And it was Harney as seen from near the junction uh, if you turn on Highway 244 south of Hill City to go to Mount Rushmore, there's a big camp run across from there called the Rafter J Bar. And um, I appreciate you asking, and I'll try not to make this too long of a story, but the fact is that is about five miles beyond Illingworth's last known position down by Custer. It took us totally by surprise. He made this long trip up that valley, let's just say from Crazy Horse up to halfway to Hill City to that junction where Highway 244 goes right to, to Mount Rushmore, went out in that pasture where the campground is, and you can see Harney Peak, and that's what he called Godfrey Peak. And Godfrey was another officer on the expedition. Now, Illingworth may not have realized this is Harney Peak from another angle. He might not have known where he was. So to answer your question, we consider that the last photo that has not been found. Um, you know, with the exception, I, I, there's always an exception, but like Custer sitting with his Indian scouts in front of the tent. We can't, you know, there's no background. We can't tell if that was in the hills, out on the plains. You know, there's a couple of photos like that that are so close up, there's just no reference points. But otherwise, all the landscape shots, I think we've, we've tracked down and, and that's one we need to update in that new edition of the book coming in three or four years, I don't know. All right, any other, I hope that answered that. Yeah. Does the uh, location Yes, uh, Turkey Rock uh, is what, yeah, these guys called it Turkey Rock because it looked like a turkey to them. It looks like an elephant to us. And they're, I, I believe the reason for that is in 1874, people had, white people like us, hadn't seen that many elephants yet. I mean, I'm serious. They just weren't familiar with the concept. And uh, 
Um, you know, you're some guy from Ireland that came over on the boat and joined the cavalry and now you're out in Dakota Territory. When would you have seen an elephant, you know? And so um, that's my theory uh, a little bit without a lot of research. But uh, it does look like a turkey if you squint and maybe if you've been drinking some of that uh, Bass Pale Ale or something, I don't know. But yeah, they called it Turkey Rock and that's between Custer and uh, Hill City and, uh, uh, yep. It was 1972, we went elk hunting down by Pringle. Okay. Oh. <laughs> they showed us the picture huh. and thought since we were hunters, I'll be we darned. might know where it's at. But I swear they called it elephant. Well, they, they might have. And that's what it looks like to us if you just look at the picture. And I, I, you know, again, I struggle what to put in, what to leave out. One thing I have not mentioned is South Dakota State University, as many of you probably know, did a book in the 1970s where they found a lot of these photo sites. We were able to build on what they did and, and figure out, you know, add to that. And uh, they might have called it elephant rock in that book, I'm not sure, but uh, so maybe that's where that confusion, but they, they didn't do a great job of documenting where these photo sites were, so we were still kind of having to rediscover them a little bit. What was the rush? Why did they only take 60 days and not hang out? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if I, there probably is a rationale. I don't know if I've got a great answer for you. Um, they might have just thought that was enough time, uh, you know, fall was coming. I'm sorry, I don't have a I, yeah, let's ask, let's talk to John Nelson about that. Maybe he's got an idea on that one. I'm trying to remember if there was a specific reason they had to get back. You know, they were pulling in resources, wagons and men for this expedition, and maybe that was part of it. They needed to get them back to wherever they were going, you know, but uh, yeah, I don't have a great answer for you. All right, any other questions? Yes? I wonder what tribe the scouts were from. Yeah, what tribe the scouts were from. There were definitely some Eastern Santee Sioux, which is, you know, interesting. Uh, they were Sioux, but they were Eastern Dakota, Santee Sioux. And, you know, that area, I'm, I'm kind of pointing towards like Minnesota, Eastern Dakota Territory, you know, it already kind of, the frontier was there now. And so they were signing up with the military as, as scouts. But uh, Bloody Knife was a half, they called him a half breed, I hate to use that term, uh, half re, half Sioux and grew up in a Sioux Indian village where he was beat on by the other Indians and just treated awfully, hated the Sioux, hated the Lakota. He's a scout for Custer, you know, and goes out to Little Bighorn and fights and everything else. So some of them were Re or Rikara Indians. Those terms get used interchangeably a little bit, but uh, there were a few, a few Dakota Sioux as well. And I think they're, I think they're all listed in the roster, and I'm trying to remember if, they're, if their uh, tribal affiliation is as well, but, uh, they were, uh, you could say they were enemies of the Sioux, of the Lakota. You know, these, the Rikara and the Ree had been uh, attacked by the Lakota uh, at times along, at their uh, villages along the Missouri River. In fact, uh, Bloody Knife's nephew had been killed by, this, by some Sioux, I don't know which Sioux, but by Sioux just a few weeks before this expedition. So, um, you know, he had an ax, oh, boy, that's an awful cliche, ax to grind, I'm sorry. It just came out. But, yeah. <laughs> All righty. Thank you. Thank you.